Thank you, Tim, and uh, welcome everybody. As he said, the title for today's talk is a Ghidra test drive. Uh, so we're going to take a little look at a new tool that the NSA put out uh, back in March. Before we do that, just a quick little bit about myself. As Tim mentioned, I am a SANS instructor. I teach Forensic 610. I am also an Internet Storm Center handler, have been since, oh, wow, 2002 or something like that. In my day job, I am a malware analyst and forensicator for AT&T. I am GSE number 26, and in my copious free time, I uh, like to ride my bike, and I'm an instrument-rated private pilot. What we're going to do today is, uh, the, you know, the title of the talk was a Ghidra test drive. So most of the presentation today is going to be a demo. Talk a little bit about uh, Ghidra, but the, the meat of this is we're going to dive in and play with the tool a little bit. I will admit up front that I am not a Ghidra expert. I have... Uh, been playing with it on and off since it came out, but there's a lot about the tool that I don't know. So if any of you have any additional tips or tricks uh, or interesting features of Ghidra that you care to share with me after the presentation, I'd love to hear from you. My email address uh, was on that opening slide. It'll be available when this all gets posted. I will set aside a little time at the end for uh, uh, questions, if any of you have any. As Tim said, just type them in the, the chat window, and we'll get to them towards the end. So with that, let me uh, dive in a little bit. Uh, first of all, let me switch over here. First of all, uh, Ghidra is a tool that was released by the NSA in March at the RSA conference. The current version is uh, 9.0.4. It can be, you can find it here at the ghidra-sre.org. Uh, there's a really nice installation guide Ghidra is written in Java, so to actually use the tool, you need to install both the uh, Java runtime environment and the Java development kit, the JDK and the JRE. Uh, so it does take a, a little more resources on the machine that you're going to be installing it on. And let me switch over to my virtual machine here now. So what you download from their website is a zip file that when you unzip it is this folder right here on my desktop, Ghidra underscore 9.0.4. And in there, you've got uh, a .bat file that you can use to run it from Windows, or this Ghidra run is a, a shell script that you can run it from Linux or uh, Mac OS. I've uh, made a shortcut onto my desktop for that .bat file, so I'll just double click on it here. And you get this nice little window here that tells me I have no active project. So if I'm going to start working on analyzing 
a sample that I believe is malware. First thing I need to do is create a new project. And you can create a non-shared project or a shared project. Uh, if you create a shared project, yeah, it starts up a essentially a little web server and multiple individuals can then work on the sample simultaneously. I'm going to open a non-shared project here for the moment. Uh, it's going to place the file in by default in the user's home directory. I'm just going to call this one malware. Well, it says I already have a malware one. Okay, well, let's call this malware zero then. And now I am ready to add malware samples to the project and start examining them. Um, if I do a quick look over here in my home directory, uh, you'll see it's created this malware0.gpr. That's where uh, Ghidra is going to store the this particular project and you know, whatever I do with this project is all going to be stored in that file. So uh, I have this sample uh, that I'm going to add to the project. So I just drag it over. As I said earlier, um, Ghidra is written in Java. So uh, one of the the, the upside of that is that obviously it can be run on multiple platforms. Downside of it is that it's Java, so it's uh, going to be interpreted. It can, can run a little bit slower. Uh, you want to dedicate as much memory as you can to it. So, okay, I've dragged this in here. And it has done a little preliminary analysis, determined that this is uh, an x86 executable, little endian, 32-bit, uh, Windows, that it's a portable executable file. Uh, just like in IDA, for those of you who have used IDA, um, if you had some sort of a binary blob that you wanted to put in there, you could do that too. Um, Ghidra can handle a number of different architectures, not just x86 and not just Windows. It can handle um, Linux ELF binaries, can handle ARM, uh, MIPS. For today, since I'm you know, since I teach Forensic 610 and we concentrate on Windows malware, that's what I'm going to do for this demo as well. So, okay, click OK, and it will attempt to import the file. As it does this, now again, this is going to take a little bit of time. It's going to do, you probably can't see all of the little comments that are slipping by here, but it's doing some parsing. It, uh, you know, it's looking at the imports and, um, you know, and trying to figure out which DLLs this imports, uh, looking at some of the, it knows about the basic Windows DLLs. So it's matching up, um, the imports with the actual names and that kind of thing. And maybe I should have imported this before we started this demo because this is taking a little bit of time. And this virtual machine that I'm running in, in is just the the same Windows virtual machine that we use in uh, Forensic 610. 
And I guess I should turn Windows Defender off here. So once the import is done, you'll see this little summary up here. Um, stuff up here at the top, already saw. You'll see the size, um, number of symbols, data types. Yeah, it determined from the metadata and the executable that it was compiled with Visual Studio. Uh, down here, you can see it detected you know, some imports, and so Ghidra has gone and uh, looked up some of the info that it has on the on the system DLLs. Okay, so if I then double click on this, it opens what Ghidra calls the code browser. And since this is the first time that we've looked at this particular sample, it says it hasn't been analyzed. Do you want to analyze it now? Obviously, the answer is yes. Then it shows you a bunch of analysis options. A lot of them are already selected. One of them that for some reason is not selected by default that I really like to use is this propagate external parameters. And I'll show you why I want that in a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that one. These, these two prototype ones, I, I usually leave off. Click analyze. And now down here in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see you know, the hourglass flipping and the progress bar uh, as it's doing its analysis. And the analysis actually is, is usually fairly quick. Um, but as I said, you know, it's, it's in Java, so it's not gonna be necessarily as fast as Ida's initial analysis, since Ida's written in uh, C. You can see from the, the little bar over here how much uh, of the code the, the Ghidra has analyzed up to this point. And I, I refer to Ida here a lot because prior to the release of Ghidra, Ida was the disassembler that I used most often and most of my colleagues that I uh, work with on malware analysis, we usually used IDA, so that's why I refer to IDA so much. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with IDA, you can still use this just fine. Um, I'll show you a little bit of the, the interface here. So analyzing functions, analyzing references. And it's still analyzing away, crunch, crunch, crunch. So while it's doing that, the, this main window right here in the middle is the is the disassembly window. This is um, the window where you'll be able to look at the disassembled code. Over here on the left, you've the up here at the top, we've got program trees. Frankly, I don't use this this window too much. Okay, so incomplete information. Okay, so be it. So our analysis is complete. I, I frankly don't use this program trees window too much. What I do use quite a bit 
is the, the symbol tree window down here. So I'm going to close this program trees one. From the symbol tree window here, we've got the imports, we've got the exports. Since this is just a normal PE file, um, and we don't have, you know, it's not a DLL, so the only export we've got is um, the entry point. But we do have the imports here. Let me see if I can zoom in on that just a bit. And oops, that's not working. Um, so we've got the various DLLs and then the functions within those DLLs uh, that get imported. This is one of the ways that I often will start analyzing uh, a malware sample that you know that I'm not familiar with is just by taking a look at the Windows API calls, you know that it that the program tries to make. Um, so we'll let's just pick Reg Open Key XA. That's uh, a Windows API call used to open a Windows registry key. Uh, that happens quite a bit in Windows executables, but it's always interesting to me to see in the sample that I believe is malware um, what registry keys the, the malware author may be attempting to open. So if I right click on the well, if I if I simply click on the the name, I'm taken to the uh, over here in the disassembly window. I now see where the import uh, entry is. If I then so if I right click on this and go show references to. Get this window, which you know, shows that there are apparently two calls to Reg Open Key XA. Um, and if I click on one of them, I'll, I'm just randomly picking the second one. If I click on that, I have now been taken to the call to Reg Open Key XA. And if I hover over that, I can see again the where that calls to, which is the the entry in the imports table, which will then in turn jump to the into the DLL. Now, one of the things that I when I was doing the analysis, I checked that box to turn on the um, propagate external parameters. Doing that is what filled in this info here, these comments. Uh, that are comments that I really liked in Ida too. Uh, when Ghidra knows about an API call, it can fill in comments explaining what the parameters are to it. Now, 
I I like the way that Ida used to present these, which is with a semicolon uh, in front of the comments so I could see that they were actually comments. Turns out that I can do that same thing here in Ghidra. If I go to the edit menu, edit menu, tools, options, and I go to the listing fields and go to EOL comments field and click this checkbox here to show semicolons at the start of each line. That puts the, the semicolon at this line. That just is easier for me to make sure that I'm that I can differentiate what's a comment from from what's actually part of the instruction. Now I haven't really mentioned this window over here on the on the right. And this is one of the really nice features of Ghidra and why I think Ghidra is going to get uh, a fair amount of use in the community is Ghidra has a built-in decompiler. Not just a, it's not just a disassembler, but it's also got a built-in decompiler. And over here on the right, we see the decompiled code. This is pseudo C code. And uh, this is one of the nice, nice features. You can get the decompiler with IDA, but you have to pay extra for it. Uh, there are some other tools that can give you a decompiler, but this one is, is really nice and it's helpful to be able to, you know, jump back and forth between the disassembled and the decompiled code. But if I look over here in the decompiled code, I don't see this call to reg open key XA. And when I was first looking at this sample, this is a sample that we examine in, in Forensic 610, this really confused me. And uh, when I was hunting around, I eventually found this option over here, and I'll show it to you. Again, edit tools options. I go up to decompiler analysis. One of the options here is to eliminate unreachable code. Basically, what Ghidra does is it does an analysis, and if it determines that there's code here that can never be executed, it doesn't show it in the decompilation. This can be a good and a bad thing. Uh, it's useful to know that there is code that is unreachable. Uh, ordinarily, a compiler, uh, as one of its optimizations, and uh, you know, one of its optimizations is usually to eliminate dead code. And so it won't generate. So the compiler won't you know, won't generate code that it doesn't get executed. But um, if that optimization isn't turn on, turned on, there could be code in there that is never executed, or the malware author might be uh, sorry, somebody saying that it's difficult to see my screen. So let me see if I can uh, if I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, 
and Yeah, this is the first time I have done this for SANS, and I'm not seeing how to zoom in. Sorry, I will try to fix that in a minute. Anyway, um, as I was saying, the, one of these, one of the options here is for Ghidra to essentially do that same uh, compiler optimization for you and not show unreachable code in the decompiled window. I, I find that both good and bad. Uh, it's good to know that there's you know, code that won't ever get reached. On the other hand, it's confusing to me when I have uh, an API call like this one that I see in the disassembler window that isn't in the decompiler window. So by uh, unchecking that option and then applying having it uh, redo the analysis. I now see that apparently this particular call to reg open key XA is not reachable. And in the decompiler window, it's inside an if false. Okay. that. That's useful to me. Now I can see that maybe I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this particular API call because it is not normally reachable. Okay. Ah, okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so, okay, uh, this particular API call is not reachable. I can see that that's within an if-false. Um, so ordinarily, then, I'd probably not spend any time uh, analyzing this particular call. Uh, however, since my goal here today is just to show you some of the features of Ghidra, I'm going to go ahead and continue looking at this particular call. Um, if you're at all familiar with uh, with the calling conventions uh, in 32-bit uh, Windows executables, um, you know, the Windows APIs uh, usually use standard call, STD call, which means that they push the operands onto the stack in reverse order uh, before the call, and then the caller cleans up the stack afterward at the end. So if I look up above here, I see push, 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 push. Um, these are the five parameters to reg open key XA. One of these here is hex 8000001. I don't know about you, but I don't off the top of my head remember which. Uh, which key this represents. But I can change that. In IDA, I would have used the um, right clicked and you, uh, chosen use standard symbolic constant. Well, Ghidra can do the same thing. In here, in Ghidra, they call it an equate. So I can set equate. And then I, it comes up with a number of options. If I happen to, and I do happen to know that the, the registry key uh, 
H key option is going to start with H key underscore. If I start to type that, it narrows that down. So here I can replace that 8000001 with symbolic constant H key current user. And that is much more useful to me. And if you notice, when I changed it over in the disassembly window, it also changed it over here in the decompiler window. So that's, that's useful to me. It keeps these two in sync. Okay, so which particular sub key within the, within H key current user are we trying to open? If I hover over it, I see the, where this string is defined. I see it's the name that Ghidra has given it is this S underscore software backslash Microsoft backslash Windows backslash Cura underscore 00413C70. The 00413C70 is the address in memory where this key, uh, where this string is located. And just below that, I can see the you know, software backslash backslash Microsoft backslash backslash Windows current version backslash dot dot dot. Okay, that still doesn't tell me which one. So one thing that I could do is I could click on that, double click on that string that takes me there again. That's not showing me the whole thing. Um, I could set a parameter to uh, set an option to show me more of that string. But one of the useful things that I noticed is if I just look over here in the decompiler window, it actually shows me the whole string. So software Microsoft Windows current version run. Okay, if you do any malware analysis at all, the run key should be a familiar one to you. This is one that malware will often set in order to uh, establish persistence. So by creating a run key, uh, it can survive user rebooting the system. Uh, let's see. And I'm not sure if there's anything more I really want to say about that right just a second. Um, another way that I could have uh, started examining this sample is looking at, at strings and one way that I can look at strings so I can go to the windows menu here click on defined strings and now I have all of the strings that the, that Ghidra was able to find. And, you know, if I want to see where a string is referenced from, you know, I can
Oops. You can double click on that. That brings me back over in the disassembly window. I can see that this is referenced from four different places. And if I hover over those, I can see you know, here it's moving that string into EDI at address 00403575. Uh, if I um, you know, if I double click on that, that'll take me to that address. Um, let's see. Now, let me go back here. Um, and you've got these forward and backward buttons, so you can uh, you know, move back to where you came from before. Um, Let's see what other interesting functions here. <laughs> Excuse me. Another of the of the nice features that I've come to count on in Ida that I wanted to see if I could also find in Ghidra is the ability to um, rename functions or uh, adjust labels. So you know, let me go back to the top of the function in the decompiled window because that'll be quicker to find. So if I've got a function that I've been analyzing and I figure out um, what it, the function does, I can click on the name of it. And in Ida, I click the, you know, press the N key uh, to rename it in In Ghidra, I'm not seeing that option here. Did they just move it on me? I'll do it over here because I should be. I'll do it from the decompiler window. I can rename the function. Uh, I can call it uh, registry stuff. And that will change. You see, it changed it over here in the, in the D, uh, disassembler window. It changed it in the decompiler window. Also, if I click over here in the symbol tree in the functions, I should now see, oops, that was labels, not functions. The, the functions that um, Ghidra uh, finds but can't, you know, can't figure out what they are. It names fun underscore something. But now, you 
No, I renamed it and it should be over there and I'm not seeing it. Uh, there it is, registry stuff. Another of, the, another of the tools that I often use in IDA is um, where the disassembler ha has some sort of a hex value. Sometimes the hex value isn't useful to me. Sometimes I'd rather see it in some other base. If I hover over a hex value in Ghidra, it will show me hex, decimal, and character representation. If I want to see that, um, if I want to, if I want to change the display to always show that in both the disassembler and the digger. For the moment, I'll just convert this to a decimal. And that will change this to a push 128. Over here in the decompiled window, it changes this to a 128. Um, you know, if this were stack strings, I could, you know, change this to a character. In this case, it isn't a, a useful character, so I won't bother with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of the other uh, useful things is, you know, sometimes rather than looking at the this assembled view here. Um, sometimes it's useful to look at the graph view. Now this particular one is, you know, is, is pretty complicated. I can use the scroll wheel to zoom in here. And with the graph view, then you can see the basic blocks. And anytime we come to a conditional jump, then we have these two. And if I hover over it, it shows that um, you can see then the red arrow is if the jump is not taken. The green arrow is if the jump is taken. Uh, again, just like in Ida, you can do this there. And there are times when this is, can be a really useful way to see what the code is doing. Personally, I don't tend to spend a whole lot of time in this, but I know people who, who prefer the graph view, so. You can get the graph view with Ghidra. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, one of the other things that I sometimes like to do is to see what calls are made from a particular function. And one way to do that, if you click on this green arrow, show function call trees, you can see that, that this 
is only called from one location from the from the main function but you can see the other functions that this one calls uh, it calls you know f u n underscore zero zero four zero f three five zero which is another local function but it also calls uh, get current process open process token close handle get proc address reg create x key a copy file delete file create thread reg open key x a which we were looking at earlier reg set value x a yeah, for for those of you who do any malware analysis at all, um, you know some of these API calls should look very familiar to you. You may even be able to tell some of what's going on, you know, some of what this malware sample is doing just by looking at the API calls. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and answers. So let me get out of that. Um, one other, one other useful feature that is available in all of the disassemblers and decompilers that I'm uh, that I've used is if I have a particular address, you know, say I'm debugging and I want to look at the code around there in the decompiler here. Uh, if I have a particular address that I want to jump to, uh, just like in IDA, I can press the G key and type in an address here and jump directly to that address. And I, so let's say 0040404E, and this will take me directly to that address. Um, yeah, I, let me wrap wrap this up here for now. I, this is a really, really useful tool. Uh, I think those of you who haven't played with it yet are really going to like it. Um, it has all of the capabilities that I use on a regular basis in other tools. Um, so. Let me let me wrap this up and throw it and switch back and take any questions that we may have. Um, okay. um, thanks, Jim. It was a great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q and A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenter, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first question is, does Ghidra have significant features that replace IDA Pro? I, again, I'm not a, a Ghidra expert. I uh, have played with it some. I, the, the biggest, reason why I expect a lot of people to switch to Ghidra from IDA is that it's free and the and you get the decompiler for free. Uh, those of you who have used IDA know that it is not cheap. It It's a great tool. It is in my in my usage of it um, I have not found a whole lot that 
uh, Ghidra can do that Ida can't. Um, I, one of the features I didn't really get into is you can script, you can write scripts for Ghidra in either Python or Java. Um, and I know a, a number of people that, uh, that I interact with uh, have been porting their, you know, their Ida Python scripts over to Ghidra, but I'm not, a, I'm not aware of very many, off the top of my head, I can't think of any features that Ghidra has that Ida doesn't. Um, but again, you know, Ghidra is free. So those of, you know, those malware analysts who didn't have a huge budget, uh, now have a really nice tool that includes a decompiler. So if if any of you out there who have used Ghidra are aware of any features that Ghidra has that Ida doesn't, I'd, I'd love to hear about them. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm still just getting to know it myself, but I figured I ought to share what I have learned with with the rest of you. Sorry if that's not a Thanks. particularly <laughs> helpful answer, but. Okay, uh, we have another question. Um, is it possible to share the analysis perform performance within Gidger without setting up a Gidger collaborative server, similar to sharing an IDB in Ida Pro? I have not tried to do it, but I that um, that that GPR file uh, might be shareable. Um, I have not tried to move that. I, I do have actually Ghidra installed on three different VMs, so I I will try that after after we get off this webcast. Um, I, I don't know for sure if that'll work, but that would if if it does, that's where I would expect the analysis to be is in that .gpr file. Okay. Um, we have two more questions. Uh, next question is: Can you tag addresses of interest for quick return slash find capability? I I haven't tried that. I haven't tried it. Uh, the, I will have to try that. My guess is probably, but I'd have to go back and look at the interface and see exactly how to do that. Okay. And the last question is: Is there a list of processing options you recommend using slash avoiding? Um, I, as I said, I, I, I turn on that, uh, the propagate external, uh, parameters in the, in the analysis. I uncheck that um, eliminate unreachable code in the in the decompiler. Those are the the two options that I I, I haven't played around with unsetting any of the other options or or setting too many of the other uh, you know listing options or. Uh, um, and as I get more familiar with it, maybe I will change some of those. Um, Anuj Sani, who's another one of the um, Forensic 610 instructors, um, listed a couple of things that he sets in a blog post he did for Silence um, a week or two ago. Um, if you uh, I don't remember exactly 
the link to it. But if you if you look at Lenny Zelter's Twitter feed, he he mentioned it there. Um, I do have a couple of so far five blog posts uh, about Ghidra. I, covering a lot of the stuff I did today and a few uh, few additional things on the SANS forensics blog. And you can find those by looking at those that are tagged with the category Ghidra. Um, and in there, I, I mentioned a, a couple of other things. I, did, I didn't really spend time here on, on comments, but a Ghidra allows you to to do comments, you know, pre-comments, post-comments, end-of-line comments, and I don't remember what they call them now, but comments that basically go at the beginning of a function. And so I describe how to do those in some of those blog posts as well. Um, but yeah, the and I I intend to probably do at least one or two more. Uh, as I get time to play with it. Unfortunately, I haven't had uh, as much time to play with play with it as I'd like. I've you know, the day job always drags me away on real cases and keeps me from just playing. Love to have a job where I could play all day, but wouldn't we all? Um, yeah, so. Now, the, the the options that I mentioned in class and and maybe a couple more that I mentioned in the blog posts would be the options that I have used most. And again, for anybody else who has played with Ghidra, I would love to hear your tips and tricks too. Because uh, as I said, I haven't had as much time to play with this as I would have liked, but it's a tool that everybody's talking about. So, uh, I want to I want to spend more time playing with it. Um, 